The Reformed Group Network is now pulling video from us as well as from some other churches. So those are getting spread around a little bit more widely than perhaps they used to. Um, I'm not going to ask if you have any questions about this morning's sermon because I didn't preach this morning's sermon, but I have no answers. Oh, he has a second part. Hey, uh, we could get him back up here to do Sunday school. That would be perfectly fine. All right. Anybody without a handout, please put your hand up. Otherwise, otherwise, we can get started now. We have a little bit of a dilemma. I gave the same handout, might lightly corrected, last week, and I thought I was going to get through three points, and we got through one point. And some people who are here were not here last week. And for the people, for the happy few who were here last week, I don't want to torture them by laboriously working through the exact same thing all over again. But I also don't want everybody to get lost. So the subject of this little study is called Man Between God and the Devil? Um, it's a title of a book by Heiko Oberman about Martin Luther, and the thesis of that book is that you don't understand Luther unless you appreciate his understanding of the devil. His idea is that Luther's doctrine of the devil is very, very important for understanding Luther overall. But I'm not really talking about Luther or about that book in this particular Sunday School series. Instead, what we looked at is that fallen humanity is diabolical in its worldliness. And we started from the standpoint of what the Lord Jesus says to Peter. You remember Peter makes that great confession that Jesus is the Christ. And Jesus starts to talk to them about, to the disciples, about how he must die. And Peter takes him aside to rebuke him, and the Lord Jesus calls him Satan. Well, he'd just gone from saying, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, to calling him Satan. But why was Peter called Satan? Why was he addressed in that very strong and striking language? Because his mindset was not on the things of God but on the things of men. That's what he was taken up with. His approach was human, natural, you could say. Well, being merely human in that situation, at least, put Peter on the side of Satan. And so we added a few other passages last week to consider the reality that being merely human is not really an option. To be merely human is to be positively diabolical. Now, this is true of fallen humanity. This is true of fallen humanity when their horizon is dominated by this world, by this world's systems, by this world's values, by this world's approaches. It's what Reverend McGee was talking about this morning. True Christianity is counterintuitive. You cannot do what comes naturally and be a Christian. That's not how it works. What comes naturally is not Christian, not what comes naturally to us in our fallen condition. So to be merely human is to be positively diabolical. And to make excuses for that is to make excuses for ultimately what is satanic behavior. Now, in a sense, I'm glad I was forced to go over this again this morning because throughout my lesson last week, I had to keep saying, but there's another side to the story, but there's more coming. Well, today we get to talk about the more. We get to talk about the other side a little bit. So if you look at your handout, the first proposition is fallen humanity is diabolical in its worldliness, and you have several verses that try to demonstrate that point of view, that perspective. Then you have another perspective. What is naturally human is innocent and good. Now, that might sound like a contradiction. I don't believe it is a contradiction, but we need to work through it. We need to be clear on understanding why it might seem like a contradiction and how it actually is not. Here again, we have a few passages. Let's turn, first of all, to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1. Now, as you probably remember... Paul is expounding on the wrath of God being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And so he goes on to explain 
how men are ungodly, how men are unrighteous, but also how God's wrath is revealed to them or upon them. And one of the ways that God's wrath is revealed at this time, at this period in the history of God's dealings with mankind, is God's wrath is revealed by giving them up. So you have it in verse 24, God also gave them up to uncleanness, or then the passage we're going to consider a little bit this morning, for this reason God gave them up to vile passion. In light of their ungodliness and unrighteousness, the wrath of God was revealed in the removal of restraint. How did that work? What did that look like in practice? For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. Now, what happened here? Well, what happened is that as God gave them up, as God removed restraints, they moved away from what was natural. Now, our interest this morning is pretty narrow. It's what is that concept of natural and why is Paul managing it as apparently something good? We saw last week, we saw in our review, what is merely human is diabolical. So where does something exist that is natural, but that is good, that you can get further away from? Well, that's what happens here. Due to their depravity, due to God's removal of restraint, people lost contact with the way things are supposed to be. They lost contact with that order, that design that is built into creation that is built into how the world functions. Now, there's a lot that could be said about that, but our purpose this morning is pretty focused. We're just drawing out from what Paul says here that there is a kind of nature. There is a sort of existence and a sort of functioning within that existence that is good. Getting away from that is a sign of God's judgment. Getting away from that is a consequence of sin already present and prevailing. Now, it's very tempting to stop here and say a few things. Let me limit myself to one thing. We understand that there is a difference between sin and insanity, right? Now, all sin, if you analyze it, if you break it down, all sin is insane because what is it doing? It's leaving the fountain of living waters to go to broken cisterns that hold no water. That is not a sane decision. That is not a rational choice. The American theologian William G.T. Shedd talked about this at some length in his three-volume work on dogmatic theology. He maintains that sin is ultimately inexplicable. You can't explain sin because sin is irrational. It doesn't make sense. It wasn't a good choice. I agree with him. There are a number of other theologians and preachers who have appealed to the book of Ecclesiastes to explain that sin is madness, sin is insanity, and I agree with them also. When you break it down, sin is insane. But is every sinner completely and entirely insane? Well, no, we can distinguish, right? We can see people who sin in different ways, and the insane, those who are clinically, medically out of their minds, they still sin. They don't get a free pass because of their condition. They do sin. But is sin the only problem that they have? Well, we're able to distinguish. But I think something that is very important for us to understand in the time and the place in which we live is that while all sin is insane, and while we can distinguish between sin and insanity, we do need to understand also that there is a connection. Sanity is not something that you just have automatically and is never threatened. And insanity is not necessarily just the total condition of your life and all there is to say about it. As humans, we are malleable. We are shapeable. We can 
become something other than we are. In fact, we're constantly becoming something other than we are. One of the things that we can become is insane. How do we do that? Well, there's multiple avenues. Obviously, some people suffer from drug-induced psychosis, right? Well, there's one avenue. There's a, a high road to mental illness is drug abuse. But there's other ways. And what I want to suggest to you, based on what is found here in Romans chapter 1, is that one way that insanity spreads is by us losing touch with creation, losing touch with the way God meant things to be. Now, I think scripturally you can make that case, but you can also verify it by experience. Researchers have said that one of the most helpful treatments for depression, for anxiety, for mental illness in general is what? A walk in the woods, sitting in a forest, being surrounded by greenery. Well, what is that? It is contact with God's creation. It is an experience of nature. Now, why is nature good? Why is nature healing? We know there's a lot of rough stuff that happens in nature, but it is a reminder that there is an objective reality, a reality that doesn't change based on what you think. It's a reminder that this reality is good because it comes from a good creator. So the more we live in an artificial world, the more we insulate ourselves from the basic truths of God the creator who made the world to function a certain way, the more we increase our risk of insanity. Well, if you look up the statistics, diagnosis of mental illness is increasing rapidly. Now, there's two possible explanations. One is there's more mental illness than there used to be. The other is we diagnose it more often than we used to be. Personally, I think probably both of those are true to some extent. But if there is more mental illness than there used to be, why is that? Well, you can pick a culprit and you can go to town because there's a lot of things around us that would tend to induce insanity. And a lot of the things that helped people preserve their sanity were no longer as involved in. Now, this is not the point of the lesson. This is not a lesson about sanity and insanity. It's just an observation that as God gave people up, they moved further away from created nature. Well, that indicates to us then that there's something in the nature that God has created that is good. And that was really the whole point I was trying to make. You might think it took me long enough to make that point, but that's, that's what digressions do to you. All right, second passage to look at is 1 Corinthians 11, verse 14. Now, here again, we're jumping into the middle of something, and we have a very narrow focus. We're really just trying to draw out one concept here. In this discussion of head coverings, Paul asks the rhetorical question, does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? Now, of course, the moment you read that passage, the temptation is to digress on the question of head coverings, men and women in the church, etc. But we're not here for that. We're here for nature. That's why we're looking at this verse. Paul asks the rhetorical question, does not nature teach you? The expected answer is yes, nature does teach us. Now, we need to stop and absorb that for a second. According to Paul, there is information in nature that should be readily accessible even to the Corinthians, and presumably if to the Corinthians, also to us, about how these things work. So what are our options here? Well, we could say that Paul didn't know what he was talking about, but we believe in the inspiration of Scripture. So that's not one of our choices. We could say that Paul was appealing to what he knew the Corinthians would think, and he's saying nature, but he really means culture. I'm not totally happy with that because 
Paul knows what words mean. Paul knows how to use words. Paul is very gifted with language. He said nature. He did not say culture. <coughs> so Paul believes that there is moral guidance. There is truth that can be derived from nature. Now here it's a truth about a difference between men and women. It's a truth about how they ought to behave, even about how they ought to look. He's not saying that this is some transcendent theological truth, but he is saying that it is truth, that it is available to us, that we ought to already know. Well, this ties in with Romans then, doesn't it? They, in Romans, he's writing about people who left what was natural, who left what was according to nature, who twisted or distorted or got away from nature. Now he's saying that nature should teach us. What's the presupposition here? Well, the presupposition is that what is natural is innocent. What is natural is good. What is natural is valuable even for believers even for those who have access to other sources of information, like the Word of God. Nature is still valuable. But if what is human is diabolical, how can there be anything good that is natural, that is merely natural? That's the dilemma I want to drive home. That's the thing I want everybody to think about for a little bit before we start giving answers. Sometimes if you give answers too quickly, they're pat answers. They come across as cliches and they don't really get into the depths because people haven't had the door of the question fully opened yet. Sometimes you need to wait a little for the door to open before the answer comes in. So while you think about that, let's also add this passage in Romans 131 and in 2 Timothy 3.3. Let's go to 2 Timothy because we were just in Romans chapter 1. In 2 Timothy 3.3 and in Romans 131, you have the same word which in the King James Version is translated by the expression natural affection. But notice what Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.3. He's giving a list of what people will be like in the perilous times, how men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers. And then he uses the expression without self-control, brutal, despisers of good. Now, in the New King James, we have without self-control. In the King James, you have without natural affection. The word in Greek is astorgos. And if you've ever read C.S. Lewis's Four Loves, this is the one he talks about under the heading of storgia, the natural, the domestic affections, the sort of comfortable familiarity that you develop over time with family members where you're aware of their faults. You're keenly aware of their faults in many ways, but you love them anyway. You still somehow manage to get along. You wouldn't swap them out for other people, even though they can never remember to hang up the dish towel in the proper place or whatever it may be. Now, if the translators of the King James were in the ballpark with natural affection as a rendition, as an interpretation of that word, then this would be yet another indication that as people double down on depravity, as they sink further into the mire of iniquity, they lose contact. They turn their backs on every good gift that God gave them, even the good gifts that are not pertaining to grace, that are not pertaining to redemption. The good gifts that are baked into the fact of creation, that are brought along with our existence in the image of God, even though that image is marred and defaced. Well, this word also occurs in Romans chapter 1, where, of course, the theme was exactly that, how as God gives people up, they lose contact with everything that is good. So we have 
two sides of the coin. Fallen humanity is diabolical in its worldliness. What is naturally human, what is natural, is innocent and good. There's good things in nature. Getting away from them means getting worse and worse. Nature even has good stuff to teach us. Are you ready to put it all together? Do you have any questions? Do you have any comments? Do you have any concerns? I've got eight minutes. And we still have one whole division and some conclusions. Okay. Before we put it all together, I want to make it a little bit harder. What is natural is against God. What is natural is innocent and good. What is natural is against God. How can we say both of those things? Well, obviously, we're working with the ambiguity that can be had in the word nature. That's, that's the bottom line. What is natural depends on how you define nature. Whether what is natural is good or whether what is natural is opposed to God depends on under what viewpoint are we considering this whole concept of nature and the natural? You are probably familiar if I quote 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. That probably rings a bell, doesn't it? Now, this word could also be translated the soulish in our natural, our psuchikos state, according to our soul as human beings. We do not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. Here, the contrast is between what is psychical, psychikos, and what is spiritual, what is pneumatikos, what comes from God by his spirit and what arises from a human's own soul. Of course, Paul here is considering fallen humanity. He's not talking about Adam in the garden before the fall, but he's talking about fallen humanity to the degree that that is natural, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Or Paul uses a related expression, but here the word is not psychic, not soulish, not psuchikos. Here the word is natural, phusis, from which you get the word physics, right? Physics having to do with the nature of things. Well, he says in Ephesians 2, verse 3, that we were by nature, we were naturally the children of wrath, just as the others. Now, not our nature as we came from God's hand, not our nature as we were created in Adam, but our nature as we were corrupted by Adam's fall, our nature as it was actually transmitted to us when we came into existence, by that nature, we are the children of wrath. So what is natural in this sense is opposed to God. What is natural in this sense is under God's wrath. And we can add one more. Jude, verse 19. He is talking about mockers who come in the last times, people who are grumbling, who mouth great swelling words to gain advantage. But what is the characteristic of these mockers who walk according to their own ungodly lusts? These are sensual persons. That's the same word that is rendered natural in 1 Corinthians 2. These are psychical, soulish persons. They are merely human. There's no breath of the Holy Spirit upon them. And you notice he kind of, divide, he kind of points that out. These are sensual persons who cause divisions not having the spirit. What is it to be soulish? What is it to be a merely natural man? Well, it is to lack the Holy Spirit and it is to be under God's wrath. What else goes along with that? Well, what goes along with that is that you're divisive. You cause fights and conflicts. You stir up trouble and turmoil. So this has gotten pretty complicated, hasn't it? Fallen humanity is diabolical. What is naturally human is innocent. What is natural is against God. How do we sort it out? How do we know when nature is good and when nature is bad? And what do we do with all of this in just three minutes?
Okay, so the first thing is, don't be alarmed by ambiguity. You handle ambiguity in language all the time. You do it, and if you're thinking, no, I don't, that's because you're not aware of doing it. You do it so naturally, if you'll permit the expression. You do it so instinctively. You do it so automatically. You don't even think about it. But you can tell, depending on the context, whether you're supposed to say read or read. You can tell whether that verb is present or past tense, just depending on the context. You know how to pronounce it. It's very rare that you make a mistake. If you're reading aloud, it would be very rare for you to say read when you're supposed to say read or vice versa, even though they're spelled the same. And that's just one example. There's a lot of words where similar things could be said. You know from the context whether cleave means cling or whether cleave means divide, and those are opposite meanings. But you can figure it out from the context. So you're able to handle this ambiguity. This is not beyond your powers. What is natural can be seen in two ways. It can be seen as what God created, or it can be seen as what man corrupted. As what man corrupted, it is inadequate, it is destructive, it is absent the spirit, it is destined for destruction. As what God created, it is good, it is worthy, it has valuable information, and it's destined for restoration. But saying that it's destined for restoration ought to give you a clue. We still need to say it's not that simple. Because what God created has been corrupted. Now, sometimes you can analyze something and you can say, well, this is as it comes from God. Marriage came from God, and marriage as an institution is a good thing. But now pick any concrete marriage. Pick any instance of married people. Are they what they ought to be? Is their marriage what it ought to be? No, no, it's not. What God gave, that beautiful, wonderful, perfect gift, has been corrupted, is corrupted in all of our case. Now, what we have to do with that then is we have to try, and, and I emphasize the word try because this, is, this part is quite complicated, where the Bible doesn't necessarily spell out all of the details, how can we know which aspect of something is a good gift of God's creation that with due care and caution we can use and enjoy, and what part of it is just so embedded in corruption that we have to let it go, we have to cut it off? That's a very challenging question. That's sort of what covers the whole area of Christian ethics with difficult decisions, with gray areas, with places where there's judgment calls. Everything, and, and Paul does this so amazingly in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. He quotes, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof from the Psalms. He quotes it two times, almost back to back. There's very few words in between. And he quotes it each time to support a different point that he's trying to make. We should receive everything God has made with thanksgiving. We should enjoy its use because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. We should avoid everything corrupt because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. What is the difference? Well, in one case, it's where the emphasis falls. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It's all yours. Use it. Enjoy it. Have fun with it. But use it for God because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It doesn't belong to anyone else. It cannot be perverted to the worship of demons, which is what's happening in the context there, right? We've got to be able to embrace both ways of quoting the Psalms, Psalm 24. We have to embrace that if we're really going to live lives of gratitude in God's good world, but if we're not going to be ensnared by the world and the flesh and the devil and pursue our pleasures to our own destruction. Those are the stakes with this topic that we're talking about. Do we live God-glorifying lives of gratitude and joy in a world that, after all, God has made? Or do we embrace our lusts and let them drag us away from everything good until we wind up in the pit of hell? Those are pretty high stakes, aren't they? 
This is an important, important question. Practically speaking, then, we need to be rigorous and honest with ourselves. We need to be able to say, you know what? This may be good, but in my current state of corruption, I can't be involved with it. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are not, to those who have an unbelieving heart, and so whatsoever is not of faith is of sin, Romans 14. But we also need to be charitable to other people. Now, it's perfectly possible that they're making mistakes. It's perfectly possible that they're being central. It's perfectly possible that they've temporarily taken up the position of Peter, right, and need to be rebuked. But it's also perfectly possible that they're able to do what we're not able to do. So we should be very honest with ourselves. We should be very rigorous with ourselves. And we should be very charitable with other people. <coughs> All right, we are a little bit over time. Final questions, comments, concerns? We might need to revisit this issue because we went through that pretty quickly. Yes, Jeff? So is uh, death natural? No. Death is deeply unnatural. <laughs> that was easy. Any other easy questions? Right. Death is natural for corrupted nature. Corruption tends to dissolution, right? Only the pure can ultimately survive. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, thank you that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Thank you that you have given us all things richly to enjoy. Thank you that you are not some stingy God who begrudges us our pleasures, but that you are a God who takes delight in the joy of your children. Help us, Lord, to receive your benefits with a grateful heart. Help us to be charitable towards others, Lord, who may enjoy different benefits than we do or who may enjoy them in a different way. But, oh, Lord, help us all to be quite conscientious with ourselves, not to deceive ourselves, not to think that just by being good neighbors that will be good enough for the kingdom of God. Help us to know that the righteousness we need goes beyond all of that. And, Lord, if our right eye offends us, if our right hand or foot offends us, help us to pluck them out. Help us to really believe that it is better to enter into life blind or maimed or limping than it is having all our faculties, having enjoyed everything to the full, to enter into everlasting destruction where the worm does not die and where the fire is not quenched. Lord, give us wisdom. Give us insight. Give us most of all, Lord, those hearts that desire to enjoy what you give and truly desire to root out completely everything that is opposed to our God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. We can stop the broadcast. Sunday school is over.